Hello and welcome to Podcasting for Public Engagement, a workshop for the Humanities Division at the University of Oxford. I'm Kira Allman and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow in Media Law and Policy in the Center for Socio-Legal Studies. And I'm going to be running this session, which is normally a hands-on workshop about designing, editing, and producing your own academic podcast or really any kind of podcast that you want. Um, but unfortunately, we can't all be together right now. So I am recording a bit of this workshop remotely myself. It's going to be a little bit experimental because obviously I'm used to having a room full of people that can participate in the process. And right now I'm just talking to myself on a screen. So it's a little bit weird for me. It might be a little bit weird for you, but the goal by the end of this session is for you to kind of have a sense of how to put together your own podcast and also a, a little bit of an understanding of uh, how to edit audio. And if you have any questions after the fact, feel, uh, please feel free to email me and, uh, and ask. I'm always happy to answer questions about podcasting. So let's go ahead and get started. I am going to share my screen with you. Here we go. All right, podcasting for public engagement, a tutorial. It's not really a workshop because I'm the only one speaking. Um, that's me, I'm Kira Allman, but you can find me on Twitter and that's my email address. And like I said, please feel free to get in touch if you have any questions after this session. So why am I here talking to you about podcasting? What experience do I have? Well, over the past several years, probably since about 2014 or 2015, um, I have worked on a number of academic podcasts, uh, quite a few more than the ones pictured here, but this is a little sample of some of the podcasts that I've produced over the years. And um, uh, I actually got started with the podcast Rights Up, which you see there, which is still running. Uh, it's the podcast of the Oxford Human Rights Hub, which is based in the law faculty. And uh, that podcast uh, was originally funded with a very small torch grant um, in order to get things off the ground. And at the time, podcasting was kind of pretty new in the world of academia. And so we were one of the first uh, groups to pitch doing a podcast and it was very experimental and it turned out that it works pretty well. It's still running now. So um, since then though, I've wound up working on a lot of other podcasts, mostly because I had an interest in audio editing and I really like the format and the more experience I had, the more opportunities I had to continue to produce podcasts. So uh, when I finished my DPhil at Oxford, I actually worked freelance for a while, uh, helping to produce podcasts for public engagement purposes for various different research groups and teams in all sorts of different disciplines at different universities. And as a result, I'm coming into this session with a, a fair amount of experience kind of converting academic content into a podcast format. And like I said, you can kind of use the skills and techniques in this session for any kind of podcast that you want to produce, whether it's academic or just for fun. Um, but I'm going to kind of put the emphasis a little bit on translating academic research to a wider audio audience. And uh, so that's where we're gonna go from here. Of course, there are a lot of professional podcasts out there, many of which you've probably listened to yourself. Um, on this screen, I've just put a few of my favorites that are on my regular podcast rotation myself. Um, and you may recognize a lot of these, you may listen to some of them, but there are so many out there, lots of different genres and lots of different options of things to listen to. You're probably coming to this session because you already had an interest in podcasting and you're thinking maybe it's something that you want to do. And uh, if not, uh, and you're completely new to podcasting, I would encourage you to pick maybe one or two podcasts off the screen and check them out later. Um, Normally at this point in the workshop, I would ask you what your favorite podcasts are. Um, first of all, so that I can kind of get an idea of a uh, new podcast to listen to myself. So um, if you wanna send any of those to me, tweet them at me, send me an email, please do. I'm always interested to hear what you all are listening to and expand my podcast library. And I'd also encourage you to think as I start talking through the next couple of slides about uh, the, your favorite podcasts, why do you like them? Them. What are the elements of those podcasts that make you want to keep tuning in and keep listening? Um, and I would like you to think sort of beyond the content to kind of the treatment of the content. What is it about the entire audio experience that you get when you press play on that episode? 
that makes you want to keep coming back time and time again. We're going to talk about that a little bit later in this session. There is one major goal of this session. Um, you know, no matter what happens between now and the end, <laughs> there's one thing that I really want you to take away. And that's that you should feel by the end of it, like you can get out there. Um, well, actually don't get out there, just stay home mostly <laughs> and try podcasting. You should feel fairly capable by the end of this to uh, go ahead and give podcasting a go with the tools that you have available to you right where you are at home in your living rooms. And um, that works pretty well because we're all a little bit confined right now and there isn't a lot of opportunity to go out and seek different skills or different tools and equipment. So the good news is you should be able to give this a go with things that you have at your fingertips right now. So in the course of this session, I will be covering what makes a good podcast um, from a number of different angles, how to plan a podcast. Not sure why I capitalized podcast there, but maybe I just thought it was really important. Um, and the basics, and I really do mean bare basics of sound editing. We're going to take a look at how to edit the audio that you record in an open source free software called Audacity toward the end of the session. And I'm just going to kind of run you through how to do that using some audio that I have already got at hand. Normally we would do this in person and we'd get to record some things together, but uh, this is kind of going to be a very quick crash course version of that hands-on part of the workshop. So just to kind of frame where we're headed in this talk, I think it's a good idea to take a step back and reflect on what most academics mean when they say podcasting. And this is still true now. Uh, it's been true kind of since I started doing academic podcasting. A lot of times departments or um, individual academics will say, you know, I think we should really podcast this. And what they mean is usually something like this. I'm just gonna play this audio clip for you now. So, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to those who are joining us for the evening talk. Um, and for those of you who've been here for the whole conference, uh, we've made it to the end. We just have one more very warm room to sit in. I do apologise. Um, I've gone looking for the air conditioning. They've removed the controls from here, so um, we are going to have to sweat out the last 45 minutes. Uh, but we'll probably be heated up with rage and passion through Caroline's wonderful. <laughs> um, so uh, I'd like to introduce Caroline Fiano Perez. We're very fortunate to have her here. Um, tomorrow she'll be. All right, so you get the idea. You know, we listened to the first, you know, 20 or 30 seconds of this podcast recording. Um, it's a podcast from a UK university um, that is available on SoundCloud. And uh, you might notice a few things about this recording. First of all, um, I played it for you without really any context, obviously. And it's pretty difficult to tell within the first 30 seconds what the podcast is about. Um, also, you've got a lot of kind of extraneous information there. Do we really need to know that the air conditioning isn't working and that there might be a reception after the session? And um, those kinds of extraneous things really don't need to be there. And they're kind of just delaying us getting to the point. Who is the speaker? What is the topic of this podcast? And why should we be tuning in? There are also some kind of audio elements that are a little distracting. There's a lot of room noise. It sounds like the speaker is kind of far off. Um, that would probably be exacerbated by the fact that the audio didn't sound that loud to me. But um, all of these factors make it a little bit unpleasant to listen to as a podcast. And usually when academics say podcasting, what they mean is something like this. They mean place a recorder in front of a speaker during a lecture or other kind of talk, and then put the recording pretty much unedited, raw, up online for people to listen to afterwards. And that's perfectly fine. It makes uh, academic content more accessible in a lot of ways. It means that if you miss the lecture, you can listen to exactly what you you missed um, later on. But in terms of a listening experience, it's really not that enjoyable. And as a result, the people that are going to tune into something like that are probably students who are required to listen to the lecture or people who are just really, really keen on the, to on the topic. You're not probably going to draw in a lot of other listeners for something like that. It's hard to get through an entire lecture um, remotely unless you're very committed. But of course, this 
was what I knew as podcasting. So by contrast, when I think of a podcast, I don't really think of a, a recorder placed on a lectern in front of a speaker. I think of a professionally produced podcast like This American Life, which is produced by National Public Radio in the United States. And I'm just gonna play you a small clip from this by contrast. Um, and uh, the, This American Life actually just won a Pulitzer Prize for um, audio. And I'm going to play you a bit of the prologue of the episode that that won that prize. So I'm going to exit this for a moment and play you a bit of this. A quick warning, there are curse words that are unbeeped in today's episode of the show. If you prefer a beeped version, you can find that at our website, thisamericanlife.org. Darwin's nine, and he's a kid who, I don't know, people just give him stuff. When he met my coworker Aviva, he was playing with a soccer ball somebody gave him, eating a taco somebody else gave him. And Darwin's mom was explaining all this. Can you just describe what just happened? I have no idea, she says. A man, as you're talking about that people just give him things, walked by and gave you, how much did he give you? Yes. Wow. Ten pesos. Why did he give you that if you've asked him? Darwin gives a little shrug like, eh, what can I say? Because he thought I was asking for a coin. His mom says, he was just sitting there, eating. You're like king of the camp. Yes, I am the king of the camp, he says. As Aviva sits there with Darwin's mom, Elizabeth, he runs off for 15, 20 minutes at a time and then returns with cash. Ay, Dios mío, santo Dios. Cinco dólares. Cinco dólares. <laughs> Five dollars. She hugs him. Ay, tan linda. Muchachito. Darwin runs to their tent to pull out all the money he saved and show Aviva. $279, a huge wad of cash, which, for context, they're living in a makeshift tent camp in Matamoros, Mexico, right over the border from Brownsville, Texas, and I mean, like, immediately on the other side, nestled against the U.S. and the Rio Grande and the customs office. You can see the big red arches of the border station. It's so close. Okay, so you kind of get an idea of how that episode is going to develop. Um, by contrast to the, um, the other academic podcasts that we listen to, this is a podcast that is obviously scripted and very structured. Um, and what you've got are already a lot of interesting sound elements to kind of draw the ear in. You've got the background noise of the camp that they're in. You don't exactly know where they are or what the context is or why you're hearing about this little boy collecting money yet but you're intrigued because they've created a soundscape for you um, to enter and to kind of be uh, enveloped in. And you've also got music coming in at a certain point, and usually you know, that's the point at which they're going to start laying out what the episode is about. And, um, and of course, you've got kind of the personalities of the people speaking. You've got the hosts and you've got the interviewees and uh, you can tell that they're weaving together a story already within the first minute or so of that episode. Um, so that was kind of the standard that I was trying to aspire to uh, when um, my friends and I uh, got together to create our first kind of academic podcast. And this would have been probably back in about 2015. And what we came up with was this podcast writes up. So basically what happened was a friend of mine and I were having a casual conversation one day. Um, she's a human rights lawyer and I was doing a PhD in modern Middle Eastern studies. And she basically said to me, you know, I really love podcasts. And I said, I also really love podcasts. She said, I would love to do a podcast about human rights law, but make it accessible in kind of uh, everyday language so that more people could tune in and understand the topics. And I said, that sounds really great. Uh, and she said, would you be interested in trying to put something like that together? And um, I was already kind of interested in audio editing. And so I said, sure. And I was really happy to do the technical side of it while she was kind of a lot more interested in the substantive sort of what human rights law we would talk about side of it. 
And what we did was we put in an application for a really small grant from uh, Torch and we got it. And with that small grant, we went out and we made kind of the first edition of Writes Up, which is a podcast that's still running now. And so because we were kind of trying to emulate that This American Lifestyle of podcasting, what we came up with for those first few episodes is kind of our rough and ready version of This American Life for Human Rights Law. So I'm just going to play you a bit of the introduction for that. You can find uh, this podcast, by the way, on SoundCloud and also pretty much any other major podcasting platform if you listen to podcasts on Spotify or somewhere else. This is the Rights Up um, Human Rights Hub podcast page. And I'm going to take us all the way back to the beginning to listen to a bit of the first episode. <laughs> Welcome to Rights Up, a podcast from the Oxford Human Rights Hub. We look at the big human rights issues of the day, bringing in new perspectives from all over the world by talking to experts, academics, practicing lawyers, activists, and policymakers who are at the forefront of tackling these difficult issues. I'm Kira Allman. I'm Max Harris. And I'm Laura Hilly. Today's episode, Old Problems, New Media, Revenge Porn, and the Law. It can really destroy every aspect of your, your inner self and your outer life. The psychological effects of it alone can destroy you. Most of the victims that I speak to talk about how they've been diagnosed with depression, with post-traumatic stress syndrome, with severe levels of anxiety. And I mean, aside from that, you just have the symptoms that they experience. Inability to sleep at night, constant nightmares, uh, crying all the time, unable to leave the house for fear that people will recognize them. Psychologically, it is just completely devastating. And then in your outer life, it affects every aspect of your life. It can affect, obviously, your professional life. Some of these photos have been sent to victims' bosses or victims' professors, their deans. They've been kicked out of school. They've been fired from their jobs. They've been unable to get interviews for jobs. And socially as well. I mean, you can imagine if someone has some really conservative, strict parents and they find out about this, they, they potentially just kick their child out of their family and ostracize them. And, you know, if somebody has a boyfriend and they find this, it really wreaks havoc on that relationship. It wreaks havoc on, on friendships because there's, of course, a lot of victim blaming that goes around with this issue. People telling the victims that they shouldn't have taken the pictures in the first place and that they were asking for it. So pretty much every aspect of your life can be negatively impacted by this. This is Holly Jacobs, founder of the End Revenge Porn Campaign and the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative. But Holly Jacobs isn't the name she was born with. So my name is Holly Jacobs, and um, it's actually not the name that I was born with. The name that I was born with is Holly Lehuanani Thomas. And the reason that I had to change my name was because I was a victim of revenge porn. Okay, so as you can hear, um, we really did try to emulate the things that we liked a lot about This American Life um, in terms of drawing the listener in with an interview straight uh, straight at the outset, right at the beginning of the episode, and kind of not quite giving you all the information about what the episode was straight away, but allowing the interview to kind of lead you to the topic, which is, in that case, revenge pornography. We obviously really went for a, you know, hard-hitting topic right off the bat to try to catch people's attention and, uh, and grab people's ears. And uh, there are many, many things that I would do differently in the editing now for an episode like that, but in general, uh, I'm pretty proud of the way that we ultimately structured those first episodes. They're all uh, about 45 minutes long, some, somewhere around there, and we uh, edited them in segments. So much like This American Life, they're done kind of in chapters of about 15 minutes each, each covering a different aspect of the topic in question. And in that episode, it would have been revenge pornography. So that's what we came up with. And um, 
I, it's probably a little bit difficult for you to tell since I'm playing the audio through uh, my computer to this video, but um, in the end, the quality of the recording was pretty good. We were very happy with it, and I think um, it still sounds good even all of these years later, and at the time, we were really just working with mobile phones, our own phones, and this free software, which I'll be showing you later in the tutorial. So it is possible to kind of get started with just the tools that you have, because that's exactly what we did, and then we subsequently started kind of upgrading our equipment as time went on and I'll talk a little bit about that later on but it's a good example of how you can accomplish something that sounds fairly professional considering we had no expertise whatsoever um, with just the tools that you have to hand. So one thing I like to talk about um, in this session is sort of the why of podcasting. Why choose to podcast as opposed to do any other kind of public engagement activity? There are a lot of things that you could do. And um, I'm obviously a big advocate of podcasting because it's something that I'm passionate about. But I think there are a lot of really good arguments for podcasting. Um, if you're thinking about justifying it to yourself or if you're thinking about justifying it to a funder or a department or something like that. And these are uh, some of the key things Things that I've learned over the years of podcasting um, are really appealing things about the medium. So the first thing is immersion. And what I mean by this is that you can hear from experts in a field in their own voices, which is really something kind of special. And you can create a, a whole soundscape, an entire auditory experience for the listener. You can actually take the listener from their living room or the bus or wherever they're listening to your episode to the place uh, auditorially where, uh, where you are recording or where you want them to be listening. And that's really cool. It's a completely different experience to reading text off a page that's been written by an expert or reading a quote from an expert on off the page, which is the typical medium that we academics use. We write. Um, and being able to hear people speak in their own words kind of automatically makes things more accessible. And that sort of segues to the next point, which is accessibility. Podcasting really does make your content um, a lot more accessible in a number of ways. First of all, it makes uh, the subject matter available for free online. Um, most podcasts are free. Uh, you can uh, share them, stream them, embed them pretty much anywhere that you want. And so it's a great way to showcase the work that you've done in various different platforms. If you've got a personal website, you can host the podcast there. You can just link to it there. And uh, the fact that it's free is really great. It's kind of um, democratizing the knowledge that we often just keep hold up in the university. At the same time, it also uh, conveys the knowledge in a different way. So uh, rather than uh, information just being purely textual, now you've got an auditory uh, audio version, um, which is great for people who, are, uh, who learn best by listening as opposed to reading. And so it provides an alternative format for doing that. And sometimes having a conversation or uh, having somebody speak through a topic makes it a little bit clearer. So it caters to different kind learning styles, different kinds of learners. Um, the next uh, key appealing aspect of podcasting is its affordability. I've kind of alluded to this a few times already, but you can actually make something that sounds really great for very low cost, uh, especially when you're just getting started. And compared to other mediums uh, like video, um, it is much easier to just get started with the things that you've got to hand um, in terms of both the editing and also the equipment that you need. So it's extremely affordable. You really can just start trying to play around with audio uh, today, right now, with just your laptop or just your phone or um, things that you've got right in the room with you. And finally, this last one is something that I sort of discovered while doing podcasting. It wasn't something I anticipated going into it which is that it's also very good for networking. So it is a great opportunity to bring together different voices from all over the world and lots of different um, forms of expertise. Um, and in inviting people to participate in the production of the podcast, whether that's as interviewees or as editors or producers, um, 
or guest hosts, uh, it's a really good opportunity to expand your network. People, uh, in my experience, really enjoy participating in and contributing to a podcast. It's something different, especially for academics. And so in general, I've met a lot of enthusiasm for participating in this kind of public engagement medium. So uh, it's a great way to kind of build out your professional network and maintain a connection with people. Use it as a way to contact people that you just want to hear from or that you just want to speak with, um, people that you're interested in talking to and listening to. And as a result, you know, you get the benefit of basically learning from them in the process and, uh, and also uh, make, creating a connection that hopefully will be a lasting one because you'll be able to share the content for a really long time, years really. So networking is kind of um, an unexpected uh, side effect benefit of podcasting. And we've found, especially with the Human Rights Hub podcast, that we've built some really meaningful relationships uh, as an organization with people that have done podcasts with us before. Because if they enjoy the experience, which they often do because it is fun to put together a podcast, um, they kind of then stay committed to the ongoing material coming out of the hub and the uh, activities that we as hosts and as members of the organization have continued to undertake. So um, you might want to consider that as being sort of a knock-on benefit of podcasting. Um, now we're going to listen to uh, a little interview with Nigel Warburton. Um, Nigel Warburton is uh, an academic. Um, he started one of the earliest academic, let's call it, podcasts um, called Philosophy Bites. And he's been podcasting for a really long time. And uh, he did this great interview. It's just a short few minutes with the LSE Review of Books. And I'm going to play it for you because it'll give you a little break from listening to me speak. And basically, I 100% agree with everything he says about podcasting and all his tips about academic podcasting in the short interview. So I'll just let him say it to you and then uh, and then we'll carry on. The digital revolution, the computer revolution has given academics the possibility to create, edit and disseminate audio, audio visual as well as the written word around the planet to anybody who's got a, an online connection. This is quite a radical transformation of communication because previously we've always had to rely first of all on skilled technicians, secondly on um, being commissioned by some authority like a publisher or a, a radio station. But now anybody who's got an idea can explore it, experiment with it, and if it's interesting enough, they'll find a listenership, they'll find a readership. So you have a set of highly successful podcasts starting first with Philosophy Bites. How did this project come about? Well actually it was David Edmund's idea. I made the podcast with David Edmonds, who's a BBC producer and a writer, he co-wrote Wittgenstein's Poker, for instance, which was a best-selling book, and Rousseau's Dog, and, and a great book about, about chess, Bobby Fischer Goes to War. So um, David had this idea of making a series of podcast interviews, and uh, we asked a few people if they'd sponsor it. They didn't want to, so we bought the equipment and made the series ourselves. How do you fit podcasting into your busy academic life and your professional life? The actual process of, of interviewing somebody takes about an hour for us to make a program of 15 minutes. So that's not particularly labor intensive. The serious work goes on a little bit before, but a great deal of it afterwards. The editing process is absolutely crucial to making a good podcast, I believe. And so I'm very fortunate in working with David, who's not only, he's not only got a PhD in philosophy, uh, but he's also an expert editor and very fast at editing audio so the combination works very well but that editing process and the knowledge of editing feeds back into how the interview is conducted because the structuring of the interview subtly affects the possibilities of editing so his knowledge as a radio producer is immensely valuable there and I've learned a huge amount from that. Before the interview there's obviously a certain amount of reading but that's not laborious if you're going to meet one of the most interesting contributors to your field, it's a joy to be able to prepare a little bit and, and talk to them about the subject that they really care about. That's actually a great privilege. It's part of my education. I've had two or three hundred tutorials with some great thinkers. It's, that's amazing. It's not, it's not something that conflicts with academia. It actually enhances it. 
When you're interviewing someone, there's a delicate relationship in a way because although they're very knowledgeable about their subject, they may be nervous. They may be more nervous than you. And I think you need to be sensitive to that. Some of the things that I've found work quite well is, first of all, if you're visiting them in their office, they're on the whole much more relaxed than if they're in a new environment, they've had to travel on the tube or they've had to go up some stairs, they might be puffed or they feel uncomfortable if it's a studio-like environment, it's slightly threatening for somebody who's nervous about public speaking. So I think, if you can, go to get them in their own habitat and actually take some time just to talk to them, not necessarily and preferably not too much about the content of what they're going to say because there's a real danger they'll rehearse it once and then never give the performance because they'll feel they've said it all. But just get them speaking so their voice is relaxed more because you can hear tension in the voice, particularly if someone's listening through headphones. They pick up on all the subtleties of the voice and if somebody's at all awkward or uncomfortable or hesitant because they're nervous... That comes across immediately and and disrupts the communication, I think. So it's very important to get them speaking to relax their voice. And if you can, get them to smile because smiling when you speak is audible. And that's one of the best bits of advice I was ever given about how to speak when you're on the radio or when you're doing a podcast. Try and smile because it improves the quality of your voice. Even if you don't feel happy, make the facial gesture of a smile. Okay, so uh, that was Nigel Warburton on academic podcasting. As I mentioned before, I wholly second all of the things that he said. So um, just keep that, those pieces of advice in mind as you go ahead to start creating your own podcast. So uh, in order to get started planning a podcast, these are a few things that you should be thinking about, um, starting with the style of the podcast that you want to produce. Now, there are a lot of different podcast styles out there. And you may have been thinking actually up until this point, well, I'm actually not a big fan of the This American Life way of podcasting. Usually I like listening to chat shows or I like listening to live recording podcasts. Um, That's totally fine. There are loads of styles out there. There are podcasts about sports, podcasts about books, podcasts about poetry, loads of things out there. Um, And if there is a particular style that works for you, try experimenting with that style just in the academic genre, if that's what you're going for. So um, on here, I've tried to consolidate a lot of the dominant styles of podcasting that you hear the professionals producing. One is the interview-based podcast, where you basically do a one-on-one interview with someone. This would be a bit like the BBC profile, um, detailing somebody's personal experience. Uh, Another would be a narrative-style podcast, um, and that's kind of a little bit more like the This American Life style. It's scripted. You bring in kind of different sound elements and different voices in order to tell a story from beginning to end of the episode. Another form is the monologue or the essay. This uh, is something that you can certainly experiment with uh, at home, which is basically you write a short essay and you read it. But of course, you need to make sure that the essay is written to be read as opposed to, uh, sorry, written to be listened to um, rather than written to be read off the page. So uh, what you'll want to do in crafting that essay is read it aloud to yourself repeatedly um, to make sure that it will sound interesting uh, in audio format. But it's a really easy, straightforward way of talking about a particular subject um, and preparing something that's actually kind of very naturally academic in style, but could work really well auditorially. Um, Another form is a chat show. You could bring guests on and just have a really casual chat. You could have um, kind of a panel of of friends or colleagues that you typically have interesting discussions with. Bring them on and record the discussion. Um, You know, we're all stuck at home at the moment, but you could do this sort of via one of the voice over IP platforms like Zoom or Skype or FaceTime and, uh, and then see how that comes out. See if you can add some interesting music elements, if you can edit it in a way that makes it engaging. Um, So a chat show is another kind of dynamic 
podcast style. Another is a live recording. This would be something, uh, it could be a panel discussion, it could be a chat of sorts, it could also be something more in the category of like a lecture or a seminar. Um, and if you go that route, I would encourage you to think about how to edit that in a way that will make it more engaging than just basically recording the live event and putting it up on the internet. Are there uh, things you can take out to make the flow better? Are there elements you can bring in like music or sound effects to kind of heighten the, uh, the experience for the listener and make it more engaging? Of course, sort of related to the live recording um, element, uh, live recording uh, strategy is a lecture. You could, of course, record a lecture, um, even though I tend to advise uh, academics and everyone to steer away from that kind of traditional form of record a lecture, upload it on the internet. Um, you can uh, craft lectures to make them more audio friendly, to make them more podcast friendly. Um, if you've ever participated in a successful uh, MOOC, a massive online course, um, you uh, might know that if uh, material is crafted specifically for listening or viewing, um, it often works a little bit better than if it's crafted to be uh, performed in front of a live audience. Um, I'm very aware of the fact that um, that might not be working in this case for me since I normally deliver this talk in front of a live room of people, um, but it's a good example, kind of a, a, a reflective moment for me to think about whether that's working for me in this context or not, and I think that that's something to consider if you're thinking about producing a lecture for listening uh, asynchronously later on. And of course, there's also fictional podcasts. Um, so far, I'm not aware of anyone who's come out of this uh, podcasting course workshop and created a fiction podcast, but I would really love to hear one if you do decide to put one together. There are a lot of great fiction podcasts out there that basically are radio plays that are scripted and they have got characters and they are acted by, um, by actors. And, uh, and they bring in a lot of different sound elements and sound effects and things like that to give you sort of a sense of, um, of the space, a little bit like the archers or something like that. So these are all sorts of different styles. There are probably many, many more that I didn't touch on here that overlap with these categories. But the point is to think about what the actual audio format is that you want the material that you're producing to wind up in. And that will help you structure the episodes themselves, the series as a whole, and also decide, make decisions about things like, do you want to have interviewees or do you want to have a standard cast of characters, so to speak, people that you bring on every week or in every episode. You also really want to think about your audience in making those decisions. So who is your target listener? And I think ideally we all want the target listener to be just everybody. <laughs> it would be great if everyone listened to our podcast. But realistically, you wanna start with kind of a very specific goal in mind. So for instance, for Rights Up, the Human Rights Hub podcast that I started uh, years ago, um, we kind of felt like the target audience was going to be people who already sort of worked in the field of human rights, but weren't lawyers themselves. So we wanted non-lawyer human rights enthusiasts to listen to it, which meant that we had to kind of translate legal concepts into more accessible format in a number of ways and make it engaging for people who maybe practice or work in human rights in different ways. And uh, from there, we then kind of expanded to things like we wanted law students to use it and we wanted maybe more sort of uh, just the general public to listen to it. And so we started mixing things up a little bit down the line, but ultimately that was our, our starting point. So as you're thinking about this, uh, I want you to consider kind of whether your audience is going to be other academics. Um, that's perfectly valid. Maybe you're speaking to your community of scholars. Um, do you want it to be students? And are those students going to be university students? Or are they maybe younger? Are they sixth form students, GCSE level students? Um, I've had people take the course who are interested in producing podcasts for primary school students, which is its own unique kind of challenge. Um, attention spans tend to be shorter, so episodes need to be really snappy and very, very engaging and things like that. Are you targeting other experts um, that maybe aren't academic? Are you targeting policymakers, for instance, um, who work in your field but aren't in uh, the proverbial ivory, ivory tower? Um, are you targeting just enthusiasts, people who are interested in the subject matter, like history buffs? And you'd like history buffs out there to be interested in the kind of history that you study. 
Um, children, as I mentioned, is, a, is another ca category, um, kind of overlaps a bit with students, depending on what the content of your podcast is. And of course, there's still the general public, you know, <laughs> if you just want everyone to listen to your podcast, then you need to try to make it um, catchy and interesting to a listener who's kind of just wandering along through a selection of podcasts and might want to uh, give yours a listen. Thinking about your audience is crucial because it dictates things like the kind of language you use and it might even dictate a little bit what the format is. So the style that we mentioned in the previous, uh, on the previous slide, um, that style might be best suited to a certain type of audience. And you may want to play with different combinations as you're kind of plotting out your own podcasts. So in terms of planning a podcast, there are a few other considerations you need to take into account. Along with the style of the podcast, what's the structure gonna be, and the audience, who are your target listeners. Um, you also wanna think about evaluating the costs of the podcast. And I mean costs in kind of a few different ways. First of all, do you have a budget? And if you've got a budget, um, then you can think about things like what kinds of equipment might be useful to upgrade to in order to make the sound quality of your podcast better. Will you need things like studio space or travel funding in order to go and physically interview somebody? Uh, that's obviously less likely to be an issue in the immediate future, but hopefully someday soon we'll be traveling around to do interviews again. And most importantly, perhaps, is how much time will the podcast take you? Now, in that clip that I played you of Nigel Warburton, he does talk about the time commitment. It helps to be able to divide up the tasks among a team of, uh, of people on, that are all working on the podcast. Maybe somebody's really keen on doing the interviews, someone's really keen on doing the scripting, and someone's really keen on doing the podcast editing, so the sound editing. And that way you can kind of divide up tasks and do them together. Uh, when I first got started, I did have a small team of people, uh, uh, two other um, academics uh, with me, who were mostly interested in doing the interviewing and setting the topics and themes, and then I did most of the sound editing myself, and that worked pretty well. Um, in terms of a time commitment, people always ask, well, how long does this take? And as a rule of thumb, I always uh, advise that um, you anticipate that it will take about one hour of editing time for every minute of your final podcast. And this, of course, depends heavily on the style of podcast that you wind up with. But um, so, uh, you know, if you decide to do more of a live recording or a chat show type podcast, you may do less editing. You may not. You may wind up doing actually quite a lot of editing to make it flow really nicely and to tighten up the uh, conversation for publication. But um, in general, you know, if you've got a 25 minute long podcast, you're probably looking at about 25 hours of editing, at least initially. Uh, you will get faster and faster at that um, as time goes on, especially if you're producing the same podcast and uh, you know the style and it's kind of becoming a more developed, established thing for you. But in general, I would anticipate at least an hour per minute, which I know sounds like a lot, but um, it's amazing how much time goes into uh, chopping up an interview and sort of tidying up a lot of the things on the back end uh, when you're when you're sound editing. So um, so just keep that in mind. Um, you may not want to create a longer podcast in order to save yourself a bit of time. Um, when I got started with Writes Up, I was working on my DFIL and uh, initially it was really fun and, and great to dedicate all of that time to those episodes and ultimately we decided, oh, it was taking too much time and we needed to cut the, the style down. Um, so we changed the format a little bit so it became a one-on-one -on -one interview and that made the editing a little bit easier and more manageable. So, um, so now... Uh, our podcast episodes are more like in the range of 25 to 35 minutes long and they're a single interview and uh, those typically take me about one working day to fully edit so you know seven or eight hours basically so you do get more efficient as time goes on but it's just worth keeping that time um, time 
cost in mind. And of course, you need to do your research ahead of time. So um, even if you're doing a live chat or if you're doing a live recording of some kind, you want to know sort of what the arc of the episode is going to look like. How is the chat going to flow from one topic to the next? And what are the things that you actually need to cover in the episode? If you're interviewing people, you'll want to do a lot of research ahead of time about the person and their research and what they work on. But as Nigel mentioned in that interview for the LSC review of books, uh, doing that research is actually kind of a pleasure because it's a little bit like getting a tutorial with an expert in a particular topic each time you get to do an interview. Um, but all of that, of course, is time and energy and it's worth considering um, how much of that you have to spare. And of course, there are a few additional elements that really help as you're planning a podcast to consider including in the final product. Um, one is what personalities do you want to have in the podcast? Um, you don't have to be in your own podcast. You could have a different host or different characters or guest hosts, whatever you want. Um, but if a podcast has a bit of personality, it tends to be more engaging for people because they're tuning in to listen, obviously. They sort of want to hear. Uh, they want to hear the humanity in the podcast. Um, and that's all part of telling a story. So no matter what kind of podcast you do, you want to be able to tell kind of something of a story from beginning to end, whether that's in an interview, you want the sort of questions to sequentially follow one another. So you learn something by the end of it. What is the point that you want to get to by the end? Um, and it also means that uh, there's sort of uh, a structure to the episode to help the listener along. And I always encourage people to go deep into a topic, but actually not too deep. Uh, it's great to kind of keep things at an interesting surface level. That's ideal for a podcast and ideal for listeners who are often actually doing other things. Um, so when you think about it, when do you typically listen to a podcast? Are you usually sat still kind of fully attentive? Um, tuned in 100% to the podcast? I mean, in my experience, the answer to that is no. I usually I'm walking somewhere or I'm doing the washing up or, you know, I'm, I'm on the move somehow and my full attention is not on the podcast. So uh, it helps to um, not go too deep and also to potentially not be a full expert in your topic so that you don't go too deep into it. Um, I've found that it's been very useful to be a little bit of an outsider on all of the academic podcasts that I've worked on. The hardest podcast episodes for me to produce and edit are the ones that are in fields in which I'm an expert because I kind of feel like everything's important and everything's relevant, but you sort of have to put yourself in the ears of a potential podcast listener um, who is not an expert but wants to hear kind of the top level key uh, key elements of the of the theme that you're working with. So um, it can help kind of to be able to distill that information as um, a non as a non expert yourself to sort of be able to discern what's important and what isn't for the purposes of say a 20 minute episode or maybe even a 10 minute episode. Um, so it can help to get a little perspective on that by not being too embedded in the topic. So how do you convert research to audio format? So you've got sort of a topic or a theme that you're really interested in or that you're an expert in. How do you then take that from something that you work on in a more traditionally academic way like writing uh, and turn it into an audio program? Well, um, there are a few things to consider on this. One is what's the difference between listening and reading something to yourself? So. Um, Obviously, uh, material needs to be uh, accessible when it's spoken in order for it to be effective in the podcast format. And there are a few key tricks for making this work. One is using simple sentence structure. Again, I'm randomly capitalizing things on this slide and I don't really know why. Um, so what I mean by that is avoid complex and nested clauses. Put the subject at the beginning of the phrase, pretty much always, if you can put the subject at the beginning, do it. And of course, always write in the active voice. And uh, that's kind of advice that, uh, that we get in writing a lot, but it's really, really crucial for audio because you, you kind of hear the difference a lot um, when you're saying something out loud. And on that point, it's always a good idea to read 
whatever you're going to be recording into a microphone aloud before you do the recording. Um, you will definitely hear immediately when things are clunky or they don't work or you're tripping over the words. And so doing that process of reading something aloud is essential. So always do that. And another thing is to repeat yourself uh, a few times. And I know that sounds kind of maybe counterintuitive, but repeating themes, topics, um, ideas throughout a podcast episode, especially if it's around a 20 minute length or longer, is very helpful because of what I just mentioned uh, on the previous slide. People often aren't paying full attention to a podcast. They're usually doing other things. So if you really want people to have a take home message, if you want them to remember what the theme of the episode was or what the core or argument was or um, or come away with a few key facts you need to make sure to signpost those key elements uh, very clearly and probably signpost them multiple times remember how we talked about this a few minutes ago well related to that thing we talked about a few minutes ago here's this new topic and then a bit later on you know um, that new topic that we discussed was really interesting because it tied into the previous topic and actually as we're talking about those two topics together here's another thing to be thinking about it it really helps the listener recall as you go through the episode what was important from the previous material that they've already heard. And so repetition can really, really be your friend there. Uh, remind the listener what they're meant to take away from your episode. Always, always explain complex, complex topics and clarify any acronyms or jargon. No matter how obvious it may be to you, always just explain it. And keep everything as short as possible. And that means uh, if you're doing an interview, keep the questions fairly short, not a lot of preamble, um, just get straight to the question. And when uh, interviewees give their answers, if you are heavily editing it, which um, often you wind up doing, if, even if you're trying to keep things sort of natural sounding, answers I find are best at like a two minute uh, or two and a half minute length or shorter. So um, obviously some interviewees don't speak like that. Um, some, some are a little bit more rambling and more uh, circuitous in the way that they cover topics. But, um, but if you can somehow edit them down uh, to about two minutes or two and a half minutes, that's really ideal for a listener who's kind of listening to a Q&A back and forth. And of course, keep it kind of casual. The less formal the podcast, the more accessible it is to a wide range of listeners. And of course, this will be heavily determined by the audience you're trying to target. The tone, the cadence, and kind of the, the level of language and uh, formality will be very dictated by your target audience. And as I mentioned before, of course, give it some personality, um, whatever that may be. So uh, now I've got a little activity that you can do for yourselves at home. Um, I, if you want, you can pause the workshop video now to kind of do it right now, or you can kind of just come back and do it later. Normally, of course, we would do this together in the session. But um, what I'd like you to do is just pick an academic article in your field. Uh, it can be kind of anything and read the abstract or at least the introduction if the abstract isn't um, very thorough and just read it out in its textual form. Um, what you'll probably notice is it's not that easy to read aloud and uh, it's, it's probably not ideally written for an audio listener. So then try to rewrite that abstract or introduction for a podcast listener who's going to hear it through headphones in an audio program. That may just involve for you rewriting or restructuring the sentences, or it may involve kind of just taking the key ideas and totally starting from scratch. How would you do this as an audio program instead of a paragraph of text? And then think about what you had to change and what made it better. What things did you focus on from that, from that text? That, um, how did you decide what to focus on? Um, what did you pull out of it as the key elements for a listener? So take some time and do that, uh, do that at home. It's a good way of practicing actually later on when I cover how to use the audio editing platform. This might be a good sort of experimental thing to do so that you've got a bit of audio you can play with. Try recording yourself sort of translating an academic article into an audio format and then experiment using the audio editor with it. Okay. So now we're getting to the kind of hands-on, how do we actually do this, do this part of the workshop. 
Um, so this is the practice and more practice and more practice of podcasting because we're always improving. I'm still improving. I learn new tips and tricks all the time. I'm always on YouTube going down some rabbit hole, figuring out how to do some audio transformation. Um, and so this is the bit where we're going to talk about how to actually record your podcast and how to edit it, which is probably what you're wondering at this point. Before you record, here are the things that you need to do. Make a plan. <laughs> that seems obvious, but know what you're going into. Make sure you know your audience, you know the style, you've scripted whatever you need to script, you've read stuff aloud before you've started recording, um, and you just have a plan in mind of how you want the episodes to be structured. Think in terms of sound. So, you know, how can you make the episode a lot more interesting and engaging from an audio perspective? Are there sound effects you can add? Are there places where music would fit? Um, just think about how to make this an engaging experience for a listener listening probably through headphones. Very importantly, know the equipment that you're using, whatever that equipment is. If you've got a fancy recorder, make sure that you've tested it out, you know how to change the settings, you know what the menu options are, so that especially if you're interviewing somebody and, uh, and you're using your equipment for that interview, um, you're not kind of fumbling around trying to make things work on the fly and probably stressing out your interviewee at the same time. You confidently know what the buttons all do and uh, what's gonna give you the best recording for that session. Um, and write a schedule for yourself. Uh, you know, how often do you want to be releasing podcasts? How much time do you actually want to be spending on your episodes? And initially, it's a little bit of a trial and error process, but eventually you fall into a pattern of something that will work for you and your time and your availability. Those are all really important considerations as you go into the podcasting experience. What do you need? in order to create a podcast? Well, what you need is some kind of recorder. <laughs> that could be anything. Um, it can be your phone. If you own a smartphone, pretty much all smartphones have some kind of audio recorder built into them. Uh, I have an iPhone and iPhones have, for instance, voice memos built in. You can totally use voice memos, it's, it's fine. Um, you don't need, need a microphone, an external additional microphone, um, but it helps because the quality of your sound will improve if you can kind of direct the, the sound into a microphone. Uh, there are loads of uh, smartphone microphones that you can plug into your smartphone to kind of improve the sound going into your phone. So you can look uh, some of those up online and if you've got any questions about that, just shoot me an email and I'm happy to make some suggestions. Uh, you definitely need headphones. Uh, it's a really good idea to monitor the quality of the sound going into the recorder and at least to check that it recorded properly. And in the editing process, you'll definitely want headphones. And of course, you'll need editing software. So as I mentioned earlier, the good news is you probably have something you can record on, whether it's a smartphone or your laptop or something like that already. Um, you've probably got headphones if you listen to any music or audio yourselves anyway. And the editing software that I'm about to show you is open source and free, and so you can download it right, right now and start using it right now. And uh, so this basically costs you nothing to get started. And of course, if you need input or additional help or support, um, there are a lot of places you can go to get equipment and some additional input. One is you can go to your faculty or department. A lot of departments have audio equipment lying around that they never use because nobody comes to them and asks to do podcasts. You can go to the Humanities Division or Torch. Uh, I know that they have recorders available that you can check out and use yourselves. You can ask IT services for support, although I, I want to put a caveat on that, which is that they tend to get pretty swamped with requests these days about podcasting and video recording and things like that. So maybe use IT services as a last resort, but they are really helpful and they do have some useful guides available. Um, these other websites, transom.org, for instance, are really useful. The, a lot of radio producers and, and journalists uh, write little articles on there about what they use for their recording um, in the field. And, uh, and so I, I reference those, uh, those sites a lot when I'm thinking about what equipment to buy. You can go to Twitter and ask Twitter a question. Um, there are a lot of people out there in the Twitterverse that are podcasting themselves. And so if you get stuck, you can always pose a question to the internet. 
Um, and the internet, of course, is a good resource. As I mentioned, I often go down many YouTube rabbit holes deciding what software to use or um, what new technique I might want to apply to a podcast or to a recording strategy. So, you know, just good old Google is often a really good resource. And with Audacity, which is the software we'll be using, because it's uh, free software, um, there have there are a lot of people out there that have experimented with pretty much everything you can imagine on, on Audacity. So if you have a question about it, somebody out on the internet has probably already answered it. So check it out. And of course, as I mentioned, you can always email me. This uh, is kind of a photo of what my usual field recording setup kind of looks like. I've usually got uh, some kind of external microphone there. I've got my XLR cable, which I feed into. That's a Zoom H4n recorder. I've got a few different kinds of recorders, but I often use the Zoom H4n, and those are professional studio um, headphones. Um, I'd encourage you not to use uh, noise canceling headphones when you edit because you want to hear the full range of frequencies and noise canceling headphones obviously cancel out certain frequencies. That's how they work. Um, and so it's good to be able to hear everything. So if you can get a set of uh, professional headphones, they're really easy to find on Amazon and elsewhere, uh, or just use, you know, non noise canceling headphones for that. When you're editing, you want to go into it understanding that there is a technical side to editing and there's a creative side to editing. The technical side obviously involves learning the software, performing certain audio mis mixing tasks like noise reduction, compression, and EQ. You don't have to worry too much about what those things mean. You can get into that if you decide to become a dedicated sound editor. Um, but usually you're going to perform a few of those on the audio that, that you're uh, using. And of course, just how do you produce high quality sound, um, which is a little bit of a science and a little bit of an art. On the creative side, um, you want to make sure that you're editing a cohesive, coherent story. So that's about choices about the substance of the material that ends up in your final podcast. Um, and you sort of want to use your discretion on that question of how do you produce high quality sound um, in terms of listening for what sounds good. In general, trust your ears. You know, if something sounds like it's a bit off, it probably is. If something sounds pretty good, but you're not sure if it's technically totally there, uh, it probably is okay. If it sounds good, it's good. Um, so, you know, trust your instinct on that and try to listen for what sounds good and what doesn't sound quite right. Then, of course, there are a lot of artistic flourishes. Uh, you can add things like music, and I'll talk about that again in a moment. Uh, what's the juxtaposition of voices, you know, the balance uh, among different speakers in an episode, if you've got different speakers. If it's just your voice, how do you make your voice dynamic and interesting so that a listener wants to tune in and stay tuned in for the whole episode? And then, of course, audio effects. You can add loads and loads of sound effects to uh, try to kind of create a soundscape and experience for the listener if you want to. And to that end, there are a number of resources that, uh, that are out there for you to find music and sound effects and other things to add into your podcast. In terms of music, there is freemusicarchive.org. It's a huge repository of music that um, you can search uh, for royalty-free music uh, and, um, and definitely get lost out in a number of rabbit holes looking for it. There's the Open Music Archive, um, bensound.com. These are all places you can get free music uh, as well as uh, paid uh, music. And then um, for uh, for paid music, there's needledrop.co, neosounds.com, and loads more. So I would encourage you to start with freemusicarchive.org because there's really a lot on there and uh, you can start creating some cool sounds just using the free music that's available, royalty free music, and you can search by genre or instrument or, um, or licensing type, whether it's royalty free, etc. And it's a, it's a really good resource to start with. Um, in terms of other sounds, so if you want other kinds of audio effects, 
um, like a screeching car on a highway or a foghorn or something like that, I would encourage you to check out freesound.org or any of these others, soundbible.com, freesfx, or of course you can just record yourself. So sometimes if I need a door slamming or something, I'll actually put a microphone or put my phone up to a door and I open it and I shut it. <laughs> and then I do that a few times to try to get the best version of that that I can. And then that becomes my sound effect. So how do you distribute your podcast once you've produced it? I promise we're getting to the editing bit of the demonstration in a moment, but once you've edited your podcast, what do you do with it? Um, well, uh, in general, I like to use what I call the mom test, which is uh, if I tell my mom that I've produced a podcast, um, can she easily find it? Um, if I tell her the title and I tell her what it's about and she goes off to find it on her own, will she be able to find it and download it and listen to it without me, you know, intervening in some way? Um, if that's too difficult, uh, it becomes a little bit of a problem for your audience to access your podcast. So in general, um, I've found that a platform that really works for passing the mom test in terms of making it super easy to access your podcast pretty much anywhere is anchor.fm, which I've put up here in the upper right hand corner. Um, it's free. You can upload as many episodes as you want to Anchor, Anchor, and Anchor will distribute it to pretty much all the major podcasting platforms like Spotify and Stitcher, et cetera, Apple Podcasts and all of that. Um, so I would encourage you to check that out. There are lots of places that you can host a podcast. Of course, you can kind of choose what works for you. SoundCloud is another one. Um, and your own personal website or department or faculty websites. And of course, there's the Oxford Podcasting Platform. Um, in order to get your podcast up on there, you'll need to send it to uh, IT services, podcast at it.oxac.uk. And they also have a, uh, an interview consent form that uh, all your interviewees, if you have them, will need to sign in order for the podcast to go up on that platform. And I'd encourage you to use some version of that consent form anyway, if you're doing podcasting for research. It's generally good practice to just get the consent of your interviewees formally in writing so that you uh, can be confident about distributing the episodes. Um, one question that I often get at this point is, do I send interviewees uh, a version of the edited podcast for them to approve before I publish it? And uh, in general, I do as a courtesy, but it really is just a courtesy. Um, in the uh, signing of the consent form, your interviewees do consent to have the um, interview used in the podcast. And uh, quite often interviewees say, oh, I don't need to check it, don't worry about it. But as um, just as a courtesy, I tend to send it to my interviewees ahead of time with a date for release. I'll say, you know, this is going to go out on this date. You have until this date to get back to me with any changes or comments or things like that. And of course, I'd encourage you to do cross-platform promotions. Uh, you think about doing videos or photos or things like that to help promote your podcast. And then um, this uh, last point comes back to that networking point I made earlier, which is it's a great idea to invite guests who can share the podcast with their network so that you actually can widen the distribution range of your podcast by having your guests share it with people that they know, platforms, departments, uh, their communities. And then before you know it, you've got an even wider audience. So um, that's another kind of knock on effect of that networking element. Okay, so now we are at the uh, sound editing part of the tutorial. I'm just going to kind of introduce you to Audacity. Um, this will be a pretty quick crash course on what Audacity is and what it looks like and how it works. And I'm going to use some audio that we've already released uh, for Writes Up recently, um, just so that you can see how I would typically put uh, a podcast episode together using Audacity. And so I'm going to come out of this um, presentation and I'm gonna open up Audacity down here. Okay, so this is what an Audacity editing window looks like. You can um, download Audacity online for free, so just go ahead and Google it. It's a very easy download and install. Um, and then what you'll get is essentially what I've got open here. This is what the platform looks like. Now there's no audio in here, and you can see that over on this side, on the upper left-hand corner, 
I've got um, a number of um, buttons that look very familiar to anybody who's used any sort of audio player before. I've got play, pause, forward, back, stop, and record. You can, of course, record directly into Audacity on your computer, which may be a really good option for you, depending on uh, what equipment you have available to you when. Now, what I typically do is when I've got, when I'm starting to use a, a podcast, or when I'm starting to produce a podcast, rather, um, I create a folder for the podcast episode. In this case, I've got my Writes Up podcast editing demo. And I create a number of subfolders in here where I've got my raw audio files. Now, typically these would be completely unedited. Uh, these are a bit edited because I'm using old audio from an episode we've already done. I've got my music that I know I'm going to use. In this case, very simple. I'm just using one piece of music, which is our Writes Up theme song, which we typically have at the beginning and end of each episode. And if there are any sound effects I want to add, typically in Writes Up, we don't have sound effects, but for the sake of showing you a little bit uh, more of the editing process, I've included a couple of sound effects in this folder, which I have recorded myself. So. Uh, I mentioned before that sometimes I'll just do a bit of recording of sound effects myself. These are sound effects that were actually recorded in the last in-person uh, podcasting workshop that I ran in the Humanities Division. Um, we recorded opening and closing a door. Perfect. And then we've got... which was basically just me holding my smartphone uh, near a door and near somebody's feet as they walked and as we opened the door, open and shut the door. So we created our own sound effects there. Um, and you can do the same thing at home. And now that we've got all this time on our hands because we're all under lockdown, you know, the opportunities for sound effects, at home sound effects are really endless. So feel free to play around with that. Okay, so here we are in the Audacity editing window. And what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to show you just how to basically use this editing window by pulling in some audio that I've already used for a Writes Up podcast before. So um, you can add audio to the audio editor by going up here to File and then Open up in the upper left-hand corner, and then search for the file that you'd like to pull into Audacity. But uh, what I tend to do is I'm a drag and dropper myself. So what I do is I'll go over here and I know I wanna start with the music because this is a podcast I've edited before. So I'm going to just drag and drop the music file in here. Now, if I click on the audio file, you can see I've got the waveform here. Um, where I clicked my cursor, I've now got this line. And if I hit the space bar or if I hit play up in the upper left hand corner, I'm going to hit the space bar now. It should play the audio for us. Okay, so that is the start of the theme music for the Writes Up podcast episode. So that's exactly what I wanted. And I just hit space bar to start and space bar to stop. Pretty easy. Now, when I'm thinking about bringing in other audio clips, what I typically do is I open a new Audacity window. So um, I could either do that by clicking new right there. My old window is right there behind, or I can click uh, Command or Control N to open a new window. And I like to do this just so that I have another space to kind of check that the audio that I will be adding to my master, um, my master episode uh, is exactly what I wanted. So um, in this case, I know that I've got some pre-recorded audio here that I've already edited. Um, uh, or, or has already been edited. I was not the only editor on this episode, actually. Um, and I'm going to pull that in to just give it a listen. Here's the main interview for this Writes Up episode, which I've now dragged into my second Audacity window, which is open here.
And because it's been a little while since I listened to uh, this audio, I'm just going to give it a quick listen. Dr. Nicolas Espejo Yaksik. Actually, I'd like to go all the way back to the beginning. Welcome to Rights Up Right Now, a podcast from the Oxford Human Rights Hub. I'm Natasha Holcroft Emmis. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Nicolas Espejo Yaksik, researcher at the Center for Constitutional Studies at the Supreme Court of Mexico, children's rights consultant for UNICEF in Latin America. Okay, so basically Natasha is the host for our episode today, and she's already recorded the normal introduction that we have at the beginning of the Rights Up episode. Um, but actually, uh, this episode was recorded a while ago, and uh, it has been delayed for release for a number of reasons. And as a result, I actually recorded a pre-intro, so before the episode even starts, to kind of contextualize that. And, uh, and I'm also going to open up that audio file now because I've realized that what I want to do is put that pre-intro ahead of the music probably in this episode. So I'll get rid of that for now and I'm going to drag in my introduction and just double check that that is what I want at the very beginning of the podcast. This episode of Rights Up was recorded at the end of 2019 in the midst of ongoing protests in Chile. Yes, so this is my introduction that contextualizes the episode that's about to come. So in reality, I'm going to want this to come ahead of the, um, of the music before the music kicks in and the episode actually starts. So now to add different audio clips, I would very uh, strongly advise that you add them as separate tracks. Now, in all of these cases, the audio has come in as a, a, a mono file as opposed to a stereo file. And um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add new and I will add a new mono track because my audio is, uh, has been recorded in mono. Stereo just means you've got two channels. Um, and uh, I think actually uh, Natasha's recording is an example of this. We'll just check in a second. Um, and mono just means you've got one channel. So just one line of audio like we've got here. And what I wanna do is go to my other window where I've got my introduction recorded. I've highlighted all of it and I'm just doing command copy or control copy, control C. You can also do that up here by going up and selecting copy. And then down here, I'm just gonna go all the way back to the beginning and I'm gonna control V, paste it in. Okay, so now I've got my audio in here. But actually, in order to keep things visually clear for myself, I would like this to come above the music because it's the first thing that we're going to hear. So if I click on the down arrow here on the right-hand side next to audio track, I can select move track up or move track to top. If I move it up, now this is the first track I've got and the music comes in down here. Now. I'm just going to demonstrate a few of the key editing tools that you've got in your Audacity editing window now that we've got two tracks in. Up here, right here under uh, view and transport, I've got a little selection of tools. So far, I've only been using the cursor tool, which just allows me to click anywhere, move along the track, and then hit spacebar or play and start watching. Oh, but we've got a few other tools that are pretty useful. The ones that I'm going to show you and emphasize are the envelope tool, the move tool, and the zoom tool. These tools I'll also show you briefly, but they're not actually that useful, I find, uh, for my editing process, but feel free to experiment with them yourselves. So the first thing that I want to do is uh, I don't want this music overlapping with my audio. I actually want the music to start after my audio. So if I click my cursor here and I hit spacebar, you'll hear that my audio and the music are right on top of each other right now. At the end of 2019, it's ongoing and I don't want that. So what I want to do is I want to move the music audio after my introduction. So I will select this move tool here. And what that allows me to do, if I hover it over the waveform down here in the second track, is it allows me to just move that audio right over to wherever I want it. And as you'll see, it'll snap to the end of my introduction. If I want it there, of course, I can move it slightly closer or slightly farther away. In this case, I'll snap it right to the end because I think that will probably work. 
And I have a feeling that my audio is a little bit quiet um, for the overall balance of the episode so far. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here and increase the gain a little bit. So you see the plus and the minus on this audio track, which is my voice at the end of 2019. And I'm just going to increase it a little bit. I don't know exactly at the how end much. of 2019. I'll do a little bit more actually at the end of 2019. In general, it's a good idea for at the um, end of 2019 for this uh, volume uh, bar over here, as you can see, uh, it's got the left right uh, volume to be bouncing around somewhere between negative 12 and negative six. Sometimes it's a little bit to get that just right because if there's a slightly louder bit of an interview or a, a quote or something like that, it can uh, sort of max out and, and wind up clipping. And that's not ideal. So um, I, in general, if I can keep it somewhere in negative 18 to negative six dB, then that's pretty good. At the end of 2019. So it's kind of broadly there and then I can adjust it later on if I want to. Um, so I'll go back to my cursor tool up here at the top. Now my audio Settle is a little after bit a wave of popular here. unrest. What should happen next? So let's just listen through to the introduction that I have added at the beginning of the episode and uh, the segue into the music, which is the signal that the episode itself is starting. This episode of Rights Up was recorded at the end of 2019, in the midst of ongoing protests in Chile. As a result, the conversation was very much of that moment. But in spite of the delay on our end getting this interview out to you, we think you'll still find the discussion relevant and thought-provoking. When the dust begins to settle after a wave of popular unrest, what should happen next? Thanks for listening. Okay, so I'm pretty happy with the uh, timing there. I will increase the gain a bit on the music as well, so that as it comes in, it's a bit louder. Great. And now I'm going to want to bring in a bit of Natasha's interview. So she's going to have her introduction coming in. So um, I'm going to go back to my second window here and I'll pull Natasha's interview in once again. Now, Natasha's interview, uh, as I mentioned, is a stereo interview. So I've got two channels here instead of just one. So when I go back to my editing window, remember I want to add this as a new track so that I have complete control over the track. As you'll see, um, you know, I can change things separately on each track. So any transformation I do on my audio, for instance, doesn't apply to the music, which is very helpful because things might be different volumes, they might have different noise levels and all sorts of things like that. So you wanna have maximum control and that's why we bring them in as separate tracks. In this case, I'm going to add a new stereo track because Natasha's audio is, um, is in stereo format. And, uh, and I'm going to go back to my track and I'm just going to get a sense of how much of the introduction I need to come in while the music is playing. And in order to do that, because this is a longer, uh, longer clip, I'm actually going to zoom in. So I'm gonna use that magnifying glass tool up here at the top. And if I hover it over the track and I just click with my mouse, it will zoom me into the waveform and now I'm a lot closer and I can see much more easily what I'm listening to. So if I click my cursor here again, I've switched to the cursor tool and I'm hitting space Welcome bar. Welcome to Rights Up Right Now, a podcast from the Oxford Human Rights Hub. I'm Natasha Holcroft Emmis. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Nicolas Espejo Yaksik, researcher at the Center for Constitutional Studies at the Supreme Court of Mexico children's rights consultant for UNICEF in Latin America and a visiting fellow at Exeter College in the University of Oxford. In recent weeks, pop Okay, so the first bit of the introduction really is just this section here. So what I'm going to do is highlight that. I've just uh, selected it by clicking and holding and dragging. Uh, highlight that, that's what I want, and I'm doing Command-C to copy that. And I'm gonna come back over here to my music and I'm going to approximately paste it in where I'd like it to come in in the music. I can always move it later. So I'm just gonna hit space bar. Okay, 
okay, that's usually about where I'd like it to come in. So I'm going to paste her audio in here. And I have a feeling it's not quite loud enough, so I'll just increase the gain a bit. And let's listen to how that sounds. Welcome to Rise Up Right Now. That's pretty good for now. Um, however, you'll probably notice that um, right now we can't really hear Natasha's voice very well because the volume on the music is pretty high and it's kind of drowning her out. So what we want is for the music to actually kind of fade down when she comes in to speak and fade back up when she's done speaking uh, to the end of the phrase. So to do that, a good, a good tool is this envelope tool, which I've selected back up here in our top uh, toolbar menu. If I select the envelope tool, you get these kind of purpley blue lines um, appearing around your waveform. And what I wanna do is I kinda wanna put in just two of these little um, uh, sort of key, nodes, which is going to allow me to manipulate the audio. I want two at the beginning, roughly, uh, where I want her voice to come in, and two toward the end where I want the um, music to come back up in volume. What I'm going to do is if I click on this little uh, node here, and I drag it down, as you can see, it's going to make the audio a bit quieter. And you can see it in the waveform. The waveform changes. And I'm just gonna kind of approximate this for now and drag it down a little. And I can drag these little nodes along further or closer. And what this does is it makes the adjustment sort of the fade down more abrupt. If I go like this, it's very abrupt. And if I drag it further along, it's very gradual. And so probably I want something that's kind of in the middle here. I'm gonna to wanna to fade it right back up. So let's hear how this sounds now. Welcome to Rights Up Right Now, a podcast from the Oxford Human Rights Hub. I'm Natasha Holcroft Emmis. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Nicolas Espejo Yaksik, researcher at the Center for Constitutional Studies at the Supreme Court of Mexico, children's rights consultant for UNICEF in Latin America, and a visiting fellow at Exeter College in the University of Oxford. So I'm pretty happy actually with how that sounds at the moment, the way that it fades uh, down and then fades back up to full volume, the music. So I'm going to go ahead and select my cursor again, um, and I can always adjust that later on if I, if I want to change something up. Um, now at this point, uh, what I'll do is I'll bring in sort of the main interview um, uh, recording. And uh, because that's that's on stereo as well, what I want to do is I'll go to tracks and I'll do add new stereo track. And now I'm going to add Natasha's next bit after the music ends on this stereo track down here. And as you can see, it shows me with this yellow line where that, uh, that music track ends so that I can snap it directly to there. Um, but before I do that, I'm just going to demonstrate quickly these other tools so that you sort of know what they are. The asterisk um, kind of selects everything at the same time. It allows you to uh, use your cursor, use uh, to, to move things around, to um, change the volume as I've just done with the envelope tool simultaneously. I prefer not to have everything selected and movable simultaneously. I like to be able to select which um, function I'm performing at what time. So I tend not to use that one, but you may find it very useful. And this tool, the pencil icon, allows you to move sort of individual nodes on the waveform. And um, that tends not to be very useful for the purposes of editing a podcast. But what you would do is zoom all the way in. I've selected the uh, zoom magnifying glass icon. If I zoom way, way, way in to Natasha's audio here, you can see that we are really close up on the waveform. And the closer we get, 
the more easily we'll see that there are actually individual nodes on here. <laughs> and if I take the pencil icon, I can actually drag and change individual nodes along the way. Um, I don't know why you would want to do that for a podcast, but it's available to you if you do. <laughs> so now I've just uh, reversed that so that we don't have that situation. And I'm going to zoom back out because we're way too zoomed in. And to zoom back out, I'm just uh, right clicking on the magnifying glass setting. And that's going to bring us different perspective, a more zoomed out perspective on the audio file. Now at this point, let's say that I wanted to pull in some footsteps or something like that. Uh, what I would do is I would once again, oops, select my cursor. I would once again go to my other file here, get rid of that because I'm not playing with that at the moment. And I'd open one of my um, sound, sound effects. Let's say I want to have a door opening. Maybe Natasha is walking into Nicholas's office to interview him and I really want to create that effect. These are some door slams that we recorded, as I mentioned, uh, uh, in the last um, podcasting workshop we did. That's a pretty good one. And I'm just going to take that recording and Command C, copy that, move back over to my, um, my master audio. And oh, actually, because this is a mono track as well, as you'll notice, this is just one channel as opposed to two, and I'm adding a door slam before Natasha comes back in. Over here, I'm going to get rid of this uh, stereo channel that I added, and instead, I'm going to add a new mono track, which is just one channel. And right there, I'm going to go ahead and paste in my door slam. Um, so when the music ends, we've got a little door effect of you know, door opening and closing. Um, now, of course, I wouldn't typically do this in Writes Up and uh, it doesn't totally work in the context of the episode, um, but it's just to illustrate how you can add different sound effects on different lines. Um, now, there are a few uh, sort of general effects that you're likely to use frequently, and I'll just show you a couple of those on this door slam. So if I zoom in here, as you'll hear, there's a, a fair amount of noise on this track. So if I highlight this section, the door is, is not slamming, but you can still hear room noise in the background. Might be a little bit hard to hear on your end, I'm not sure. Um, but as a result, uh, it might be a bit of a harsh transition from the silence of the music track into the room noise track of the door slam. And a good trick for dealing with that transition between different um, clips is to highlight the beginning and end of the clip and to go up here to effect and to use fade in. And then on the other end to highlight the last bit, Oops. just go like this and to use the effect fade out. That basically just takes the sound level from what it normally is in the clip gradually down to zero. And if you fade in and fade out between different speakers, uh, if you're alternating voices or between different sound effects, that can really help kind of smooth out the sound so it doesn't sound like you're going from one type of room to another very abruptly. That room noise makes a really big difference. Um, the other thing that you might want to do on a track that has a lot of noise on it is uh, highlight all of it and reduce the noise. So um, there's a noise reduction tool here, over here. Uh, under the same effect panel. If you click on noise reduction, you first need to get the noise profile of the clip, which it will do now. And then once you've done that, you go to the noise reduction again, and you can adjust these, uh, the sensitivity a lot. I would encourage you to play with that because you'll hear that the more uh, noise reduction that you uh, apply, so if I were to drag this way, way over, the more distorted the noise, uh, the more distorted the track will become. So it's good to kind of keep this as low as possible while also reducing the noise. So I'll just leave it at these preset settings for now. And if I click OK, you'll see how the waveform actually reduces significantly. And now we should hear that it's not quite as noisy, so to speak much clearer sound. So you may want to play around uh, with those effects. And there are loads of effects in here that are all really useful in their own ways. And um, it's uh, a good 
place to consider going to YouTube or somewhere else to look at what other people have done to use these effects to make their podcast sound a bit cle cleaner. The better the recording equipment you have, the less manipulation of the audio after the fact you're going to have to do in the ed editing process. So that's the um, kind of appeal of having um, better equipment. Now, uh, in terms of the workflow, what you're going to want to do as you're editing is you're going to want to save this project. So if you go up to File, Save Project, go to Save Project As, it warns you that um, it's going to save this as an Audacity file, which is a project file. It's not an audio file that you can export and share on a podcasting platform. I'm going to click OK. Where I want to put it is exactly here. I want to put it in my Writes Up podcast editing demo. And uh, I'm going to change the name to Writes Up demo. And as you can see down here, it's telling me that the file type is going to be a .aup audacity file. And I'm going to click Save. Now, if I come over to my podcast demo folder, As you'll see, I've now got two new items in this folder. The first is my .aup file, which is the Audacity file that was just created from my editing window. And along with it, I've got the Writes Up demo data. Now, that stores a lot of reference files that allow Audacity to uh, pull in the audio that you're working with. So two things are very important about this. You always want to keep the .aup and the data file in the same folder. So they have to be at the same folder level within the same top level folder. The other important thing is that all of these other files you're pulling in, the music and the audio files and the sound effects, um, you want to make sure that you don't move those around into other folders while you're in the editing process in Audacity because Audacity is actually referencing those files in their home location. So if you move them, Audacity, when you open it up again, might tell you, oh, actually, I can't find that file. Where is it? And it will have a problem loading the different elements that you've added into your editing window. So the best thing to do is just to leave the files where they are as you're in the editing process. Now, let's say that we're done. Uh, we're ready to export this file. I'm happy with it. I'm ready to distribute, distribute it on all of the podcasting platforms. What you're going to want to do at that point is you're going to want to export. Now, you've got a lot of export options. Within Audacity, if you want to export as MP3, you're going to have to install an additional plugin of sorts uh, to make that possible. It's also free and widely available, so don't worry too much about that. But if you've installed that, you'll easily be able to export to MP3. Otherwise, the only options you're likely to see are WAV and OGG. So if we export as MP3, I'm going to keep it as Writes Up Demo. This all looks good to me. I'm happy with the... Um, with the settings and I'm going to put it right there in my podcast editing demo um, folder and I'm going to call this final because this is the version that I'm going to upload and I will save it and it's telling me that my tracks will be mixed down and exported as a stereo file. I'm very happy with that so I click OK. Now you can complete these um, these fields if you want. Uh, this is uh, sort of what will be referenced when the track gets pulled into people's um, iTunes and other audio uh, players if you allow them to download it. So you may want to complete the artist name, the track title, and all of that. Um, I'm not going to do that for now, but um, I'll just click OK. It will export it. It didn't take very long because this is a very short clip. But now if I go over to my podcasting demo, you'll see that I have an audio file here called the Writes Up Final. It's an MP3. And if I want to, I can play that. This episode of Writes Up was recorded at the end of 2019, in the midst of ongoing... And it sounds like a ready-to-go podcast. And so that's the file that you could share with your interviewees or your other editors uh, to check that it's all okay. And it's also the file that you can upload online. <laughs> Now, there are many other things that you may want to do with your audio, uh, whether it's uh, putting silence in or taking certain words out or splitting a clip into separate clips. All of that is very easy to do in Audacity, and I won't show you every single uh, uh, transformation that you can perform on your audio tracks, but um, I would encourage you to look up anything that you'd like to do. It's extremely easy to find. Uh, step-by-step -step guides on Audacity. It's one huge advantage of it being free and open source software.
everybody's experimented with it for a long time. So the answer to your question is definitely out there somewhere, somewhere. but um, we've kind of covered the basics here on audio editing. So I hope that this has been uh, somewhat helpful to you. Okay, so that was our crash course in sound editing with Audacity. Um, and if you have any questions about Audacity, uh, I would really encourage you to just Google them, um, in part because uh, whatever problem you're having has probably been solved by somebody who's been using Audacity for a long time. Whenever I hit a wall with Audacity, I always go online and look for step-by-step -step guides. Uh, it's one advantage of it being free software someone out there has experimented with it at some point. Okay, so uh, just some final notes on recording, and then that pretty much brings us to the end of this tutorial. Um, because we're all kind of stuck at home and uh, the lockdown has changed the dynamics of doing interviews and all kinds of recording in a lot of different ways, I thought I'd share a few tips for recording at home. Zoom and Skype, which are really common voice over IP, um, uh, platforms have uh, built-in recording features um, and so Zoom will actually record uncompressed audio with speakers on separate channels so if you want to be able to separate the audio of the interviewee from the interviewer you can do that in the settings of Zooms just uh, play around with that a little bit um, and I would encourage you if you are doing remote interviews like that where you're recording through your computer to also record your own voice separately into a recorder or if your recorder is your phone, that's totally fine, while also recording on the VOIP platform. Um, that will help you in the editing process because you'll have a higher quality recording of your own voice as well as the recording of the interviewee and it'll just give you more options in terms of which version of the audio you want to pull in as separate tracks. Um, the last tip I have for you is whether you're recording yourself, um, just, you know, yourself reading an essay or a monologue or something like that, or whether you're doing an interview and you're recording that over a VoIP platform, um, I would recommend recording in a closet or a wardrobe if you've got one that's big enough for you to sit in, um, or just to record under a quilt or some kind of heavy blanket. Uh, it just helps to dampen the extra vibrations and sounds and um, makes the quality of the recording a lot Lot higher. So um, if you can kind of avoid recording in a big echoey room with a lot of hard surfaces, that's ideal. Reduce the hard surfaces and that will make the quality of your recording better. So get under a quilt or get into your wardrobe and, uh, and try recording there. Um, so I hope that you have uh, enjoyed this podcasting presentation. And I hope that you feel kind of equipped to go out there and try to podcast in some way, shape, or form. I hope that this podcasting session has been useful for you. Um, it's a bit of a different experience doing this remotely. Um, obviously, you can't ask questions and you haven't been able to participate in the live editing process. So if you have any questions after watching the tutorial, please don't hesitate to get in touch. And I hope that you get out there and podcast. And please do share with me whatever you come up with. Uh, I'm always keen to listen. So thank you for joining me for this podcasting session.